Welcome to the Spawn of Me podcast. I'm your host, Khalif Adams. What the deal be? I hope you're all doing well on this wonderful weekend. It is the 18th of July, of July. Oh my God. 18th of January, 2020. And uh, we're here talking about all the wonderful things that you care about here in Chicago and around the world. Again, thank you everyone for listening this week. And every week uh, will you come through and rock with us here on twitch.tv slash spawn on me and in podcast land and on all the places that we reside with our wonderful dope show. I want to give a huge shout out to everybody last week for coming through, sharing some really great feedback about not only the stream, but about everything that has been going on in the past couple of days about the changes that we've had to the show about how, you know, some of the new layouts look. Um, I got some really great feedback on uh, a thing that I thought was really good, but I also didn't want to give people uh, seizures uh, with the, t- with the ticker that I put in one of our scenes uh, for one of those things. Somebody gave me some really great, uh, fantastic feedback that was like, Hey, I think it's a little bit too fast, even though it's cool and there's fun things on it. It's a little bit too fast. You're going to try to give me a headache and make me make me lose my mind. Um, so thank you again to everyone who's come through and is giving good feedback and who's giving me uh, really great things to think about and to talk about in those respects. I want to make sure that uh, doing those things and, and, and keeping everyone abreast of how things are going to be going, because I want to make sure that, you know, you enjoy the time that you're here and that you're using. Uh, the, the things that I've kind of made as a place for you to reside uh, for the hour or so that, we, that we're together um, in a good way. So lots of changes are still in flux. Uh, things are going to be moving around a little bit in terms of the visual presentation of how we do things um, until we find that perfect fit for everyone involved and that we make sure that it's really, really cool and looking good and feeling good and all those things. Um, huge shout out to Blessing Jr., uh, who was featured in our uh, Who's Invited to the Cookout segment last week. Uh, it's, it was so happy to, to be able to finally get th- some of those things out in the world and share it as well. Um, I feel like that's one of the things that I'm trying to figure out in terms of uh, building a good foundation for the uh, for the for the uh, uh, for the segments that we're going to do during the show uh, kind of going forward uh, again in terms of process and stuff. Uh, some things will be moving around, uh, like this week, there isn't a lot of what we've been playing stuff cause we've been playing kind of the same things. And also there won't be a feature, uh, for the cookout this week, uh, because the big stories have dropped, uh, during this past week and almost up to the weekend itself, uh, in conversations around multiple things, uh, that we've seen in the past 48 hours specifically, there have been numerous delays in terms of games happening been lots of conversations around uh what's been going on in the space uh on an in a diversity perspective and a diversity uh part of the conversation and there's been like just random stuff that's just happened all over the place that has just been uh, very interesting in the way that both the conversation has been brought up um and also the ways that the reactions to those conversations have also been shared and talked about as well. Uh, Let's get into that stuff. We're going to go right into the news and the 411 for this week. So there's been lots of conversations this week about so many different topics of, of note. Uh, there have been multiple versions of conversations around diversity and around, you know, how people get kind of put into specific positions. Um, one of the most interesting dis- discussions that have happened in at least the past 48 hours has been um, one that talks about uh, the DICE uh, conference is happening. DICE 2020 is going to be happening in February this year. Um, and for folks who aren't familiar with DICE, DICE is kind of this Um, all encompassing convention or conference where most of the biggest names in gaming are going to be talking to each other and talking amongst each other about how to grow the space and, and have a place where they can talk to each other about, you know, what's happening in their spheres of influence, what's happening within the games that they're making, what's happening within the industry itself that's happening. Um, and, 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 uh, good ways that they can kind of surface those conversations that they can hopefully bring to 
other people in the space. Hopefully they can bring those conversations to their internal teams and then share some of that stuff out externally in ways that feel good for for them and 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 all, all about information sharing and kind of br- building those bridges internally and externally within folks. So there was a conversation that popped up uh probably like 2 days ago, I think at this point. I think it was maybe late Friday, maybe late Thursday. Um, where, uh, the, the Academy of, uh, let me get it right. Academy of interactive arts and sciences that runs dice. They put out a tweet that showcased, um, the folks who would be, uh, running or at least be at their round table discussions. So the round table discussions are ones in which a individual gets pitched just to, to come on. And this is from what I understand it. An individual gets pitched to come on to to share a roundtable po- uh, discussion. People pitch the, what they want to talk about, and then roundtable or round robin, uh, people kind of go from table to table and kind of poke their heads in and have and listen to the conversations that are being talked about within those particular roundtables. the The tweet itself um, got a lot of heat because from the way that it was displayed. And the optics of it was just all white men and women, right? It was maybe one POC person, one POC person in the particular tweet. And black gaming Twitter, black Twitter, gaming Twitter got heated, got mad about this whole thing. They got really upset about the whole process, got upset about the fact that this was a thing that was happening and then that people weren't paying attention. Uh, people kind of got in their bag and got in their feels about it and were like, yo, this is some racist-ish that's happening right now. I don't know how to deal with this. Uh, AIAS is doing something terrible and it's awful and it's bad. And everybody got really upset about this thing. So a couple of things to note or things that I'd like to share. Uh, And I I wasn't going to talk about this at all because I didn't think it deserved merit, not in a real way. Uh, But I, I sat back and thought about it because of a couple of different things. One, there's a conversation about like no POC people being at, at dice or at least being represented in within this particular part of all the uh, activities that are, gonna, that are gonna happen during that week. That I don't know is necessarily the case. I have heard from folks that I know who said, yo, there are gonna be POC people there. There's multiple people who may not necessarily be in that tweet who will later on be shared as being folks who were uh, who are going to be giving roundtable discussions or who be a part of those roundtable discussions, who be leaders of those roundtable discussions. That's that, that's that's great. We want that to be the case. The optics of what that tweet looked like from a POC centered perspective are awful. They don't look good. They're bad. It's not what we want to see in terms of diversity and inclusion in any of these spaces. It doesn't uh, uh, make us feel as a community, again, we're not a monolith. All these things are, are, you know, per individual, blah, blah. It doesn't give the community a good viewpoint to say, well, why can't, why reflected in these spaces? There was some fantastic tweets by, by my fan, my fam Esco blades out there. Who's uh, over at Ubisoft, who is a fantastic leader of multiple, uh, 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 games over at uh, Ubisoft and, and, and has been working on games for 10 years in the, in the industry. And he's like, Hey, why am I not seeing people who look like me represented in any of these spaces? And I raised my black fist up and I'm like, yeah, I get that. I understand that stuff. Um, there are lots of parts of those conversations that I think in the initial tweet got kind of blown up in ways that were kind of just not right. So like people are like, yo, this one panel with all these white people, it's not just one panel with all, a whole bunch of white people on it that's just factually false, right? The sentiment around it, I absolutely get like, again, like AIAS didn't do a great job of showcasing what they could have as their initial tweet. Maybe it should have been one where they held it. And so they had more people who probably probably submitted or possibly submitted. Um, and so those folks were locked down before they shared out like, Hey, here's what the lineup is going to look like. Um, and then from a personal perspective, I'll be at dice this year. I'll, I'll make my first appearance at dice this year. Um, I've been lucky enough to have been asked to come. Um, I know how high profile dice is. I think it's a, it's a, it's a show that I have always wanted to go to, um, because I understand just what it means to be in the room with 
literally the biggest names in gaming, right? I think it's one of the things that we as a community constantly talk about um, in terms of, you know, what we want representation to look like and where we want to be in the room when conversations are being had at a very high level to say, here are some things that you might not have thought about. Here are some things you should be thinking about. And here are the ways that you can talk to our community in good ways that then can help you make games better, more diverse, more interesting and, and better for all of us as a group. I think that is fantastic. I think that's the thing that we should be continuing to do. I think that's the thing that we should continue to push for. I think it's the thing that is uber important that we do that work and make sure that also the folks who are in those positions of power continue to hear what we gripe about, the things that we care about, and how we can be more involved in some of those spaces um, so that we can be at those round tables and at those discussions within, within those groups of people when, you know, I don't know if this is a place where wheeling and dealing is done in the same way that E3 is. I've never been. Um, I don't know if this is more of a information gathering kind of event where it's like, you know, here's a place for all us to get together and feel like we have a safe space to talk about the things that we want to talk about. Um, and, and, and I feel like to a certain extent, I am sure that there are folks who are bringing up conversations that will challenge people in their belief systems and challenge people to think broadly about, you know, the gaming space in a real way. And although, um, I'm going as a member of the press, I was offered the ability to, um, put in for a round table. It's a lead a round table discussion. So like that picture could have had my face in it with all those people in it. And who knows, like maybe down the line when they showcase or share more people out during the process uh, of how they roll out that information, we'll see more people kind of come out um, and be represented in that way. Um, do I think that then we'll give them a pat on the back for doing it? No, because they messed up the initial uh, 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 information dump to people in a way that our community just doesn't like any, like we can't, we can't deal with that being a part of the way that the process works. We don't want that to be the way that the process works. But I will say that having had the opportunity to do so and to put my name in the, in the hat for that stuff, um, I didn't do it at first cause I was worried, not worried that I didn't have a, a, an important thing to share on the behalf of myself and of our community. But because I just wasn't comfortable yet because I hadn't gone yet. So I don't, haven't been to a dice yet. So I don't know what it's like to pitch a thing for this thing. I don't know what the opportunities look like when it comes to what the process looks like when you do run a round table at one of these events. I just don't know yet. It doesn't absolve um, dice from inviting more people. I don't know how many people they invited. None of us know how many people they invited uh, that were POC folks and maybe they didn't do it. Who knows how many people are in the hopper right now who possibly possibly didn't uh, like the things just haven't gone through yet or the, some things got submitted. They just haven't like been finished. Like nobody knows yet, but the Internet loves to be mad first instead of asking questions. And that part to me was the thing that I actually got really upset about was like, I'm I'm, a, I'm annoyed at the fact that the tweet looks like this and I know that the higher you go, the less of us you see. So it is a paramount thing to be, to get and to surface up and to ask more people who look like us to be in those rooms, because we have, again, a very broad lens in which we look at games in which we look at the world. And that perspective can never be undermined or underappreciated. But my, my initial thing was like, oh my God, everybody's so mad. And I bet you half the people don't even know what the process looks like. Cause I've been asked to be a part of that process. So I'm like, yo, I get it. I feel like people are upset and I understand why people are upset. But also like when we're upset, we don't ask questions. We just get upset. And when you just get upset, you might be missing people who are like, yo, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. Like. I remember I tweeted out what I tweeted out earlier today, which basically was like, Hey, I didn't put out, I didn't, I didn't submit my information because I didn't know what the process looks like. And I, as a first time attendee, you want to kind of learn what the lay of the land is. Um, and interestingly, interestingly enough, like people, people saw this tweet 
And they instantly, instantly got really upset. And again, I understand it, but at a certain point, like if you don't pose to the folks who are running the thing to be like, yo, what the deal be like, did you do all this work and then wait for them to possibly give an answer? People are already hyped up and mad about a thing before even the ability for those folks to give a reasonable answer or reasonable response has happened. Right. Like they didn't even get a chance to really get to the point of being like, yo, we fucked it up. Like we messed it up or we didn't do the right thing or any of that stuff. Or like we have people who are coming. They just haven't, you know, finished their application or the, you know, whoever is like there. Like it's a it's an interesting space to be if you're like, hey, we don't want to signal out after the fact that we have people coming because the folks who are upset are already going to give us crap for it. Right. They've already written us off to a certain extent. I get that idea and that sentiment as well from that perspective. But I just want people to kind of like take a step back and say, okay, yeah, this initial thing was bad. Let's ask questions. Let's try to figure out what the deal is from their perspective, absorb that information, and then figure out how we want to deal with that stuff after the fact. Now, I'm reevaluating if I'm going to put in for a panel or for a roundtable discussion. There are lots of things that I want to. And I feel like the energy that we've seen that has kind of come out of this has reinvigorated my want to kind of understand what the process is and how to, how to do it. So the way that, um, even if in this particular tweet, you don't see people who look like us represented, I can still do, at least from my perspective and for me, I can go with an open mind and an open, uh, slate of topics that I want to talk about to people so that I can try to help represent our community at those tables alongside any other POC folks that are going to be there at the event. I know that there's a part of it that is about access. I understand that we need as much access as possible to share the information that we can, but we should also be like, yo, Hey, I've signaled up me. Khalif has signaled up to like, yo, I'm going to be there. Use me as that part of the, as that part of the community to say like, oh, we got somebody going that we, that I, I would hope that y'all trust to be like, yo, let's through him, try to help get some of the topics that we want in front of the people who we want to get those topics in front of. We're never going to get all of us in the, at the table. That's just a part of the way it works. Unless we build our own tables and we've already doing that with GDoc, game developers of color, uh, Latinx, uh, 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 in their, in their conference, we're doing some of that work already. Black girl, uh, black girl gamers have been doing a lot of stuff in the UK about building our own tables. I'm trying to do that here with Spawn on Me. Like we're trying to build our own tables alongside being at tables where those other people who are some people with positions of power may reside in those particular spaces. We want to be at all the tables that we possibly can, but we should also like, yo, if we have people who are going and they raise their hands and be like, yo, that's dope. You're going, can you ask this? Yo, you're going, can you share this sentiment on behalf of whomever it may be again? There's no monolithic thought here, but if you have people who are in the, in the space who can help, and it's a commentary about if you don't ask those people to do that work, then either you don't trust the people who are, who are raising their hands or you don't believe that they can do that thing well, or you're like, yo, I want to be at the table and I don't want you to be at the table. I don't know what, I don't know which version of it may be. Or again, like some people just don't know that people are at the table until they raise their hand. I am only one person on Twitter with my circle of influence, right? But those are things that you should share out. If you're in those spaces who are like looking for people to say like, Hey, we don't have, we don't have lots of people here, but here's Ka, Ka's going like, let's figure that out. So we can help build the docket to be able to say like, here's some orders for you to go take and go be able to speak on the behalf of this section of the gaming community for a day, right? I'm willing to do that work. I've been willing to do that work for the past 10 years that I've been in this industry, that I've been doing this stuff for a long period of time. Shit, there are things that I don't get invited to that are POC centered. So it's like, hey, I figure I, I figure as myself as a person who has some things to say in a, in a reasonable form or capacity um, in this industry, and I don't get invited to all the things either. I should be getting invited to more POC centered stuff across the world and all over the place. So like bringing it back to the main subject, 
I am totally in favor of everyone raising flags and being like, yo, that was shitty. That was not great. That was not a good tweet. That was a bad representation of, of diversity in the way that we want the future to look. Cause that was the way that the tweet tweet was worded, or at least the, the, the future that, you know, people are talking about the future of games and they don't see us in that represented conversation. Totally dope with that. Speak your minds. You should be doing that work. We should all be doing that work, but also we should be trying to speak about that thing from a place of not only just seeing what we see, but also like if asking, like if people know, like if people know what the process looks like, if people know that other people got asked, if people know that some work is being done, I have, I know people who work on this stuff. I know that they're working hard to try to make the things better. So I'm like, if that's the case, then like we should be asking questions while we get upset. And that's, that's my thing about how all this is wound up going. I'm going to definitely, absolutely for sure be reaching out to the folks who run dice, talk about seeing if we can get them on the show to talk about all this stuff at some point. I think it's important to have those people at art at, at my table to talk about that stuff as a proxy to be able to reflect that information back to y'all at home because I care about our community. I care about what we do. I care about how we are represented and I'm, I'm trying on my own behalf to help showcase the beauty and, and, and wonderfulness of our community to folks who may not know and to folks who, who don't give a fuck people who don't care. There are some people who don't care about diversity and who don't care about inclusion, who don't care about seeing more POC people at the table, but I care. And I want to use whatever power and, and access and ability that I have to do that work on behalf of y'all in the small ways that I can. So I think that we should be, again, holding feet to the fire. We should also be trying to figure out good ways to communicate with people, even when we're mad. And I also hope that the institutions themselves are continuing to see these conversations happen within the circles and, 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 and get good information from that upset and from that mad and from that shade that's getting thrown, right? Is that they are seeing that information and they're filtering it and they're saying, oh, we botched this thing. Oh, we messed this thing up. Oh, we didn't do that thing right. How can we figure out good ways to pull that information back within what we're trying to do and make it better, not only for the next year, but for the year that we're currently having. So I'm going to pitch my, my, my topic in the next day or two to, to, to the folks over at dice to see if they take it. Um, and, and my other hope is that look, once the once and if I'll say if, cause I don't know if more POC folks get put, um, in the forefront in terms of being represented at dice, I hope that also our community will say, well, okay, word, no doubt. We, we got, we got pre-mad and got mad. No, I'm not going to say we got pre-mad. It, it, it was deserved to get mad. We see that the, the, the things that we, that we wanted to happen are happening. And it doesn't mean that we have to give them pats on the backs and pats on the head. But I want us to do the other part of the work that acknowledges that good things are, that things are happening. Cause I feel like we don't do that as a community often enough. I feel like we are super quick to be like, everything is shitty and everything is bad. Everything is terrible without also seeing that people are trying and are making strides and are trying to make the spaces better. Because I feel like we do, we do that. We don't do that well. And that's a part of psychology. That's a part of the way that people will use their voices on the internet often people are quick to share bad, but really not quick to share good. And I'm hoping that we can figure out good ways that we can, sh that we can change that trend in some ways going forward while also again, keeping people's feet to the fire. Like you gotta be able to do both. You gotta be able to be, to be able to do both. Like, I feel like that's a part of the process and a part of the, the, the way that we do it. Um, uh, TD in the, in the, in chat says we often remember the uproar a lot longer than we remember acknowledge the process. Yeah. Like my thing is this, like, and we have this in, 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 and especially in black gaming Twitter, right? Like we see the people who are at the kind of higher levels of discussion, right? We see it often. We see the, the, the people who are the main players all the time and everybody, this is going to sound shitty, but I don't care. Everybody kind of wants everyone to be Malcolm and nobody wants anybody to be Martin, right? Cause if you're Martin, you're not hard enough. 
You're not saying the things that are hard enough to get people to rally around you. So you can see the tweet numbers go up and you can see the engagement go up and you can see all that stuff moving in, in, in different ways. And I'm like, you need a mix of both and you need a mix of people who are both. I am both in so many different ways there. I know ma- multiple people who I speak to on a consistent basis who are multiple versions of those two ideologies of like, yo, I'm going to cause a ruckus and I'm going to throw a Molotov cocktail. And there's other people who are like, I'm going to be at the table and I'm going to do this the, the diplomatic way, diplomatic way. And people are doing mixes and matches of all that stuff all the time. We all do it. We all wear the mask and we all take off the mask and we all understand what the masks do. But it doesn't mean that you can't like if you're not running a thing at the table, if you're not running one of those round tables and you're in attendance that you don't have just as much value as if you ran that thing. You can impart massive amount of information on people by just being in the room. I don't know again, how many people are going to be in the room, but people are upset at the people who are like, I'm running this, this panel. And I can understand if it was like after like post dice, if you were like, yo, there were literally like two black people in the whole thing. Now, I will be able to report that back to everybody when I go home after dice. And then while I'm doing that signal up to people at dice to be like, yo, that's not okay. And then also signal that out to all of you in the community to be like, yo, this is my experience. But like people get hella mad early before any of those things can happen. Um, let me see what uh, Ariel Knight shares it says, I hear what you're saying, but I think that there's still part of it that you're missing. That was a built up anger that has happened. And this isn't the first time something like this happened. Here's the thing. And I totally understand that. I'm not making this seem like this is a one off thing. And I'm, and I, and I'm saying this with all love to everybody in the community. Like we know, we know that this is not a one off thing. We know that this is not a sometimes thing. We know that this is more the, usual than it is the one-off thing. And I understand that people are upset about that. I am upset about that. When I see that thing happen, I see people, I see events where there are like multiple uh, events as a content creator. And I'm like, there's only one of us here and I'm, and I may be it, or I may see another thing. And there's like not enough people who are in those spaces. I totally understand that. I rock with you. I'm with you on that, on that position. It doesn't mean that I'm saying that you should, uh, uh, you should, you should calm your voices down either. I'm just saying that if you see a thing, the first initial, uh, uh, instance or the first initial want is always to make those people the devil. Right. And I'm just like, it's not always that those people are the devil. Like that was a fucked up tweet. That tweet is not good. We don't, we don't know if any other work is being done. All I'm saying is like, just chill for a minute. Like, but that's the, that's not the way the internet works. The internet is not down to chill for a minute. Internet sees a thing, gets instantly mad, and then doesn't do any of the backup work to pull it back in to say like, is anything else happening? Let's keep abreast of this situation. Let's pay attention to it in a way that makes, makes me understand might be different a day from now, two days from now. Like the news cycle is so fast when it comes to the hot take is that always the hot take is, is the one that gets pushed, but no one gets pushed for the correction, right? No one gets, no one, no one does the work to pull back and say, well, like, oh, they had like maybe a couple people here who was there. Now, now look, I'll look like an asshole if the next amount of stuff that they showcase has no POC people in it. I'll take that. I'll, I'll deal with that. That's fine. I can, I can say that, but also I'll be there in the same respect. I'm sure that there'll be other people who might be there who I can tap on and say like, here's what are your experiences been here? And I'm saying that that shouldn't be just discounted either. Like I want as many people who look like me and look like us to be there. But right now I don't know what that looks like. I didn't make those rules. I didn't pick those people, but I'm saying I'm here and I can be the person who helps to share that information back out to the community in good ways in some form or fashion. And please, again, use me as the person who, if you have thoughts or ideas or conversations that you want to bring up, during the conversations that'll be happening during the time that those things happen, I will try to help to do that work, but I don't even know what the, 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 the particular topics are going to wind up being for the, uh, round tables yet. I don't know. They don't share that out yet. We'll know when that thing happens. 
I know that the one that I will share will probably be around specifically, you know, how is the industry addressing the issues that our community, ha our communities have, that'll probably be what my round table will be about. And I will have those discussions with people who were in those rooms and hopefully we'll find some good things that I can, again, bring back to all of you at home and we can figure out good ways to build together. Like I, I, I am absolutely in favor of everyone doing what they can to make sure that the spaces are better, have our own tables, have our own conferences, have all that stuff be what it is. Um, but I also want us to do the work of trying to figure out good ways that we can, um, be mad, but be tempered in some way, right? Like give it a minute. The hot take isn't always the best take. That's all I'm saying is, is that's, that's, that's where I landed when it came to all this stuff. Cause I was like, yo, I'm feeling like my, my inclusion in some of this stuff doesn't really mean anything. If people are just like, well, we like, this doesn't mean anything if you're not hosting a thing. So I'm just like, okay. We'll see. I want that to be different. I hope that we can figure out ways to get there and make that particular part of the conversation a little bit better. Um, we're going to take a quick break because I rambled for almost 30 minutes about that one particular thing. So we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to the Spawn of Me podcast. Uh, I am rocking here with myself doing things, making it all happen, making it work. Um, we have a couple of other stories this week uh, to talk about. Something that has been really interesting has been hearing the discussion around cyberpunk getting delayed. So CD Projekt Red um, earlier this week, or I should say maybe Thursday or Friday, I should say, they put out a tweet. They were supposed to hit their launch date in April of this year. And it sounds like, and it seems like they have shared out the information that cyberpunk is going to get delayed to September. So what makes that interesting is not about the delay. Cause I feel like everybody who was kind of paying attention to the way that that game and how big it is kind of understood already that that game was probably going to get delayed. Um, I think that that's going to be a thing that everyone kind of just like wrote down already as a, as a thing that they didn't want to believe, but they also kind of thought, uh, but now it's official. It's going to be moving out to September, which moves a lot of stuff out of April that people were really excited about. Cause there's been multiple delays that have been announced in the past, you know, 72 hours or so. What makes it more interesting has been the conversation that popped up directly uh, right right when the conversation happened about it being delayed. So the, the, the popular sentiment, at least the way it seems, is that folks are, are, are okay with delays because it means, in theory, that developers and folks who are making the games will have more time to uh, kind of spread the work out so that the thing that they don't have to do is crunch. Um, what was really interesting was about how that information came out and automatically there were lots of folks who kind of came to the, the conclusion, especially after uh, the CEO, Adam Kaczynski, I'm going to say it's Kaczynski, um, talked about you know, is that going to necessarily eliminate crunch? And his answer was, um, you know, someone asked, basically, they said during a, um, a investor call, uh, someone said, uh, is the development team going to be required to put in crunch hours, even though the game is going to be pushed out to September? And Adam says, he says, to some degree, yes. And to be honest, we try to limit crunch as much as possible. But it is the final stage and we try to be reasonable in this regard. But unfortunately, yes, there will be crunch. One of the other things that has come back around has been the conversation around the end of development on Witcher 3, which had a lot of crunch, like year long crunch for most people who were working there. So a thing that I shared on Twitter that I, that I was kind of really despondent and kind of sad about was, you know, as a as a concerned consumer and as a person who was in the press, who was like, pro pro developer being good in their personal lives and having space to be able to live their lives in a good, equitable, smart, not having to work yourself to the bone way. What do you, where do you come with? Like, where do you land as a consumer, as a, as a person who uh, uh, consumes games, who buys games, who plays 
games and who's deeply invested in, in, in the industry and in the, the culture, where are you able to land feeling good about crunch or not crunch? Like no one wants crunch. Everybody wants to eliminate crunch. Nobody wants crunch to be in the place. But if we see that the thing that we thought was going to help alleviate that won't, then where do you land? As a concerned consumer, where do you land in being like, yo, I thought crunch, I mean, I thought delays would help this, make it better. And it seems like it doesn't, which is, which, which I don't know what to do with. Right. I have no idea how to feel about whether or not this thing is going to be better if they get this delay in, because it just means that they'll be doing more of that work for longer, as opposed to you know, what they're used to having to do and getting a game out that might then not be, you know, up to its full degree uh, as good as it possibly could be. I guess my question is for everybody at home and when you're thinking, when you're listening to this and thinking about it is what uh, is the industry basically damned if you do damned if you don't at this point? And it seems like the answer kind of is yes. You know what I mean? Like it feels like the answer is, yeah, it's fucked. And we know it's fucked but we just don't know what to do with that fuckery. Right. And I don't know what to do about that fuckery at this point because I was under the assumption, like, and I was championing the things like, yeah, it's delayed. So that means that they're going to be able to, to do stuff and be able to work a little bit better and, and have better positions. Cause I'm sure that they were probably already crunching now, but now I don't even know where to land about that. I have no idea what to do with that information. And I don't know how to fix that thing in a way that feels good. Um, to me as a purchaser of games and me as a consumer of games, but also I don't even know how to signal that out to other people who are in the industry too. Like, I just don't know what to do about that thing. And I don't think anybody really knows. Like I've seen a lot of sentiments happen over the past couple of days and, and amongst the larger conversation about unionization and about people kind of coming together to do that work where the conversation is like, well, people, well, the, the PMs and the people who are making the games, the producers and all those people from the top down need to better figure out how to time the development of their games so that crunch is a crunch is never a thing. Right. I, I wonder if that's even feasible in a real way. Like, I wonder if that's a thing that you can even do, because I feel like to a certain extent, and I could be wrong because I'm not a game. I'm not a game dev. I've never made a game. I've never worked at a studio. But I would think that most times people who want to make whatever thing they're going to make, they're trying to make the best version of that thing. Um, I think the bigger that your game winds up becoming and the more hype that gets around that, the more attention then goes to it. And that heightened amount of attention, especially if you have a pedigree like CD Projekt Red does, they want to put out the best project and especially the scope of that project is going to grow if you have big ambitions, right? That then means that your game that then became a three to four year game in terms of development, then becomes like maybe a five to seven year uh, development game. I don't know how that works either. I don't know if teams are willing to stay with a, a company that long to produce one title for that long and then have to deal with the, the repercussions of, uh, working on that game post launch and doing all the things that it takes to triage all that stuff. Right. I don't know if there are segments of the people who work there who are like, Hey, this isn't as bad as people are saying it is. You've heard some of those conversations. It was a great piece. Uh, I think it was on Ars Technica that talked about some of that stuff and it gave a really good nuanced balanced conversation around like some people who were really, who hated crunch and there's some people who are like, yo, I'm, I'm, I'm compensated. Well, I think I'm doing right. I, having a big game on my resume is great for me personally in my career, da 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 Like, I think that there's multiple layers to this conversation as well, even if we can all admit to the fact that crunch is bad, right? I'm just curious to know, like, what is the now light at the end of the tunnel that we're hoping to see when we've just been told, at least again, that every option that we have on the table right now is bad, Right. Cause I honestly, like, I, I believe in, I believe in unionization. I believe that that is a, that is one path that can be helpful towards getting people in a good space. I also have worked in a union for a decade and know that even within union, uh, hierarchies, there's corruption and, and there are power structures and there are power plays and there are all those things like, yes, it will, 
at some point, if you have good representatives in your union who are representing the work staff, they will do what they can to advocate for people in good ways. But also like all those things are based within a capitalistic position anyway. Like there are parts of it that help to safeguard people, but there are also parts that don't do well by people as well. And I've, I've lived through it in real ways while working at a union back in New York for 10 years. Um, so I think it's not the silver bullet that everybody thinks it is. It's, it's one solution that helps to move things forward. Um, but I think it's, it's a hard thing to figure out. And it's one of the things I kind of want to tackle this year in terms of conversations that we have here on Spawn on Me is like, I want to bring in people who are, who can speak to those things in real ways because of the experiences that they've actually had, um, while also giving a nuanced perspective on it. Right. Like, I think, again, we see a lot of, we see a lot of, um, pitchforks, but we don't see a lot of nuance. Right. And I think those pitchforks, again, are really smart and represent a lot of the way people feel, but I just don't know if they always jive with the like on the ground sentiment that's happening all the time. And I want, I want to surface that. Cause I'm honestly curious about those. I'm, I really want to know from a, from a perspective to see what it looks like. And, um, again, like I'm hoping that folks are able to get to that point where unions are, are a real thing to safeguard people from the, the, the bad practices that happen. Um, I just hope that it's going to be a thing that we get a, a good perspective. Once those things do come to, uh, come to light to see how they get implemented and how they actually really do help everyone involved be better about how all that stuff works. Um, uh, Ray Apollo in the chat says he'd love to see a union. Uh, TD also says, I don't know specifically from a game dev point of view, but sales people dictate the timetables. If then, uh, that becomes what the devs work on themselves. I'm sorry. If that then becomes the devs working themselves to the bone and the sales people are like rock stars. Yeah. Like there's a part of that conversation too, right? Where it's like, we've seen this a lot when it came to the, uh, conversation around Activision and destiny Activision with, uh, the call of duty series where everyone was like, well, the devs on one side were like, we hate the things that we're having to put into the game for the sake of what sales and marketing wants us to put into and the, and the, and the, um, the publishers want us to put like, absolutely. Like, I think that that's a problem, um, for sure that we will continue to see happen when there is a, 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 a schism between as a gap between publishing and marketing and the dev side of the, of the house. So that's always going to be the case. That's in every section of any time you're trying to sell a thing is that, uh, marketing and PR are like, yo, we need this, this, and this, and this, how are you going to make that happen for us? Cause these are the things that the, the, the market are saying, and these are the numbers that we need to hit. And it always manifests itself in ways that don't necessarily benefit the worker or benefit the person making the thing or the person who is testing the thing. Like all those things we've seen never work well, right? We need to refine those practices too and give people better workflows, give people better expectations. And then we also have to re-educate the gaming public and the gaming consumer to say like, you don't need everything, right? We need to do that part work. You need to do that part too, where you're like, yo, everything that you see, you don't need. You don't need to want the DLC for all the stuff all the time. You shouldn't have an expectation for X, Y, and Z that then makes the developers work harder in a way they don't need to. You don't need to complain about Sonic space being different so that those people who are in that particular place have to then go work all these other crazy hours to, re to, to redo a thing that didn't really matter in the first place. There's a lots of conversations within that space that should be happening and hopefully will be happening. Uh, in the foreseeable future. I'm just curious to know like where now that we see that this is a part of the conversation again, how do we move forward to get to the next thing? Because who knows at this point, I don't even see a, a way forward that makes a lot of sense. Um, but I think that there will be things that people will be able to do longer development cycles, possibly uh, maybe uh, like Ariel Knight says in the chat, he says it'd be fine if they would hold off on announcing it three years before release. That too, like, you know, we do hear about things way earlier than we used to, uh, which I don't think is necessarily benefits, um, doesn't necessarily benefit the consumer in a way. Uh, so there are lots of different things that we could figure out how some of that works. Um, but I would love to hear it from a dev. I'd love to hear it from more devs to come on the show and talk about the process, talk about it, what it's, talk about what it's like to work in a big studio 
talk about what it's like to work through crunch directly on our show in ways. Um, Cause I would love to hear those conversations from the horse's mouth uh, in particular, cause that would be real dope. Um, last thing that we're going to talk about for this episode is uh, there was a tweet that went out or a conversation that came up in terms of um, horizon zero dawn possibly coming to PC. Um, uh, here, here's the thing about that, right? Is I'm really excited at the possibility of more Sony first party titles coming to PC. I really am hoping that that is going to be a trend that we see coming forward. I really want to see all those first party, first party title games come to PC. When I heard that Death Stranding was going to be a PC title at some point, my eyebrows got really big, really high on the top of my head. And I was like, this is hopefully going to be the thing that starts the floodgates opening. I feel like this is going to be a thing that I am hoping will become a trend because think about all the dope games that are happening on the PlayStation that only get played on the PlayStation. Like I like the fact that there were uh, exclusives in the PS3, PS4 era, but we're seeing now with Microsoft having done a fantastic job of creating multiple ecosystems in which to play your games by having Xbox, X cloud, uh, game pass, and then windows as a fourth platform that they've always had. And now are really leveraging with the fact of ultimate game pass. We're seeing all those things kind of move in a really good space and move, uh, the sentiment around what you think a game should play on and where you think you should be able to play it change a lot in the past two years, right? Conversation around the cloud conversation around all that has changed a lot. I think if Sony, it wants to get into this space in a real way, I think it would do nothing but benefit them because I feel like there are tons of people who would love to play God of war on PC at the highest setting. Just imagine how dope that game is going to look on the highest settings that you could possibly get on a PC. Just imagine what those things would look like within an RTX Nvidia landscape. Imagine what last of us two would look like on a PC. Horizon is going to look nuts. Detroit looks really good on PC. I don't know. It doesn't play good as a game, but, <laughs> but it looks really good on PC. I want all the games that are a Sony first title for Sony first title. Yeah. Sony first party title games. I finally got that out. Right. To come to PC. I want all those things. People who are mad are dumb. There's a tweet that Paris Lily put out where he was clowning people about it. And I'm totally behind that tweet. Like totally makes sense. Cause people who are making that a, a, a issue don't understand how gaming is moving and don't understand how smart it is for them to be making this decision. If they're continuing to make this decision down the road, uh, it would be so much smarter for you to be able to do that stuff right now in a way that that actually makes some sense. Cause I don't understand why people are upset about that. It just doesn't make sense for people to be, to, to care about that thing. We have a question from TD in the chat who shares, he says, uh, let's see. He said, let's see if I can find it real fast. Um, do, 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 do. He says, uh, even if it's three to five years later, do you feel playing those games would invite more people to the future current first party PlayStation games? Yeah, like I think that the thing that we, um, the thing that is going to be really cool is that it does nothing but open up the ecosystem in a good way, right? It does nothing but give you more space to be able to showcase what you want to do than being able to. Uh, showcase what those things may be, right? Like if you bring Sony games to PC, there are swaths of people who never got a chance to play those games in a real way. And then they then become a part of your ecosystem. They then become your customers. They then become the people who can evangelize what you do. And then they can ask for more stuff like Red Dead coming over 
to PC, which we all kind of knew was going to be a thing, but it was cross platform, right? It looks beautiful. No one could run it the first couple of weeks when it came out, but it looked gorgeous. And that's all that people talked about. And I'm saying there are going to be games that are coming down the line that I don't know how you divvy that up in, in a way that makes it so that, you know, you particular games as opposed to those. But I do think that some of the titles that you already had in the hopper that aren't new, you make that a part of the conversation early. You say, whatever this PS5 exclusive is going to wind up being in six months or a year, it's coming out on PC. We already have that stuff in the, in the works. We already have that stuff in the hopper or six months down the line. You have that stuff be already worked into the, into the, the, the process for when it comes out. So that that's the thing that you know is going to happen. And you're training your consumer base to look for it, to say, you can wait, you can get it now on PS5 or PS4 crossover. But next week, I mean, not next week, next year, you can get this thing on PC in an even prettier fashion. And then you understand that depending upon where those games will wind up being, you may get that thing on a sale. If you put it on Steam, we know how good Steam sales are. So you definitely would get that thing at a cheaper rate at some point. So I don't, I don't, I don't know if that's, if that's what that's going to wind up being, but I think that's the way it should work. Uh, TD also asked really quick. He says, my thought porting of these games to PC will put more money in the studio's coffers years after a game has run its course. I was considering this making new PlayStation fans directly, but obviously benefiting future development of other, other excuses. Yeah. Like that's my point is as a developer, like if I'm naughty dog, I'm looking at PC and that potential crossover as like, look at how many other people we can get on our, into our systems. Look at how many, like imagine if they said F it and they said, yo, alongside the, the PC port of a last of us two game, we're going to give you every uncharted game on PC as well. I would get that. I want to play uncharted on PC at the, at the highest fidelity I can possibly get. Anybody who says it is a liar who says they don't want that is a liar. They're dead up lying to you and saying that they don't want some of those games that you would possibly get on that system in the highest form that you possibly could. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting and very weird, uh, of course, gaming stance that people are taking to be anti this. I don't understand why you would be anti that. It's just bringing more people into the ecosystem. It's just making gaming better and, and more awesome. And for people who don't want to do that, then like, I don't know what you were trying to do in these spaces. Like we're just trying to get more cool shit into the hopper. Anywho, um, I want to thank everybody for hanging out this week and every week. Uh, it was a very, very, uh, <laughs> very, not, I'm not going to say angsty episode. Cause it was just like, I'm trying to just figure out good ways to talk about things that, that I feel like don't get talked about well on Twitter and on social media. Cause I feel like things blow up really quickly and no one takes the time to like bring the conversation down a level, uh, to, to figure out good ways. And I, and I appreciate everyone who has been not only, uh, conversing with me and interacting with me on social media, uh, but here in the chat tonight, uh, rocking and giving me good questions to ask on stream and, and talking to, to us in a really nuanced way. Um, and we want to continue to do that work again, February, I will be at dice. I will be trying to do some dope work there. Expect I'm trying to figure out if in, in, in that respect and how press interacts at an event like this, if there'll be ways to have, um, uh, interviews with people. Cause I don't know how that works, but like the fact that I might be able to sit in the room with Amy Hennig and, and chop it up with her. Hell that's, that's a dream come true. I want to be able to do that stuff too. Um, so I'll keep you all informed about how that stuff plays out. Please let me know once this goes live on our podcast platforms, uh, send me all the feedback that you have good, bad, and indifferent. Um, know that, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, to do good work here and rock and represent us and everybody else in good ways. Um, and I'll be eagerly awaiting some of the feedback that I'm going to get from that. I'm sure I'm going to get roasted at some point by somebody. Uh, but thank you again for listening to the Swan me podcast. Mad love to you all at home. Thank you so much for rocking with us this week and every week. I got to say, it's been a wonderful 2020 already. Uh, lots of fun things are going to be coming down the pipe. Next week, we're going to hopefully have the head of Lightstream 
um, and Arsenal GG on our show. Uh, Stu from that from that outfit is probably going to be talking to us about. They had this really wonderful uh, um, uh, survey that went out and and this really dope uh, info dump about like where streaming is going, some of the statistics around streaming and about how people are growing in that space. And I feel like that'll be a perfect way to set up and start conversations about all those things for 2020 for folks who are in the content creator space and especially the streaming spaces. So mad love to you all. We'll see you next week and we'll see you. So peace.